Et à présent, mesdames et messieurs, nous interrompons notre édition d'aujourd'hui pour vous transmettre en direct euh, la, de l'AE euh, la séance tenue par la Cour internationale de justice pour examiner les accusations d'actes euh, génocidaires euh, commis par Israël dans la bande de Gaza formulée par l'Afrique du Sud. Voyons ensemble. Impartially and conscientiously. I thank Judge Moseneke, and I now invite Judge Barak to make the solemn declaration prescribed by the statute. Judge Barak, you have the floor. I solemnly declare that I will perform my duties and exercise my powers as judge honorably, faithfully, impartially, and consciously. I thank you, Judge Barak. Please be seated. I take note of the solemn declarations made by Judge Adhoc Moseneke and Judge Adhoc Barak, and I declare them duly installed as Judges Adhoc in the case concerning application of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in the Gaza Strip, South Africa versus Israel. I shall now recall the principal steps of the procedure in the present case. On 29 December 2023, the Government of South Africa filed in the Registry of the Court an application instituting proceedings against the State of Israel, alleging violations by the latter of its obligations under the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. I shall refer to this convention as the Genocide Convention. To found the jurisdiction of the court, South Africa invokes Article 36, Paragraph 1 of the Statute of Court and Article 9 of the Genocide Convention. South Africa states that its applications concerns acts threatened adopted, condoned, taken, and being taken by the government and military of Israel against the Palestinian people, a distinct national, racial, and ethnical group, in the wake of the attacks in Israel on 7 October 2023. South Africa contends that the acts and omissions by Israel of which it complains are genocidal in character because, I quote, they are intended to bring about the destruction of a substantial part of the Palestinian national, racial, and ethnical group, that being the part of the Palestinian group in the Gaza Strip." End of quote. South Africa asserts that the relevant acts are attributable to Israel, which has failed to prevent genocide and is committing genocide, and which has also violated and continues to violate other fundamental obligations under the Genocide Convention. The application contains a request for the indication of provisional measures pursuant to Article 41 of the Statute of Court and Articles 73, 74, and 75 of the Rules of Court. According to South Africa, I quote, provisional measures are necessary in this case to protect against further severe and irreparable harm to the rights of the Palestinian people under the Genocide Convention, which continued to be violated with impunity. South Africa requests that the court indicate provisional measures to protect and preserve those rights as well as its own rights under the Convention, and to prevent any aggravation or extension of the dispute pending the determination of the merits of the issues raised by the application." End of quote. The Registrar will now read out the passage from the request specifying the provisional measures which the Government of South Africa is asking the Court to indicate. You have the floor, Mr. Registrar. Thank you, Madam President. I quote, one, the State of Israel shall immediately suspend its military operations in and against Gaza. Two, the State of Israel shall ensure that any military or irregular armed units which may be directed, supported, or influenced by it, as well as any organizations and persons which may be subject to its control, direction, or influence, take no steps in furtherance of the military operation referred to point one above. Three, the Republic of South Africa and the State of Israel shall each, in accordance with their obligations under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in relation to the Palestinian people, take all reasonable measures within their power to prevent genocide. Four, the State of Israel shall in accordance with its obligations under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, 
in relation to the Palestinian people as a group protected by the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide desist from the commission of any and all acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention, in particular a killing members of the group, b causing serious bodily or mental harm to the members of the group, c deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in all or in part, and d imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Five, the State of Israel shall, pursuant 2.4c above, in relation to Palestinians, desist from and take all measures within its power, including the rescinding of relevant orders, of restrictions and or of prohibitions to prevent a. the expulsion and forced displacement from their homes, b the deprivation of B1, access to adequate food and water, B2, access to humanitarian assistance, including access to adequate fuel, shelter, clothes, hygiene, and sanitation, B3, medical supplies and assistance, and C, the destruction of Palestinian life in Gaza. Six, the State of Israel shall, in relations to Palestinians, ensure that its military as well as any irregular armed units or individuals which may be directed, supported or otherwise influenced by it, and any organizations and persons which may be subject to its control, direction or influence, do not commit any act described in 4 and 5 above, or engage in direct and public in incitement to commit genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, attempt to commit genocide or complicity in genocide. And in so far as they do engage therein, that steps are taken towards their punishment pursuant to Articles 1, 2, 3 and 4 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Seven. The State of Israel shall take effective measures to prevent the destruction and ensure the preservation of evidence related to allegations of acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. To that end, the State of Israel shall not act to deny or otherwise to restrict access by fact-finding missions, international mandates and other bodies to Gaza to assist in ensuring the preservation and retention of said evidence. Eight, the State of Israel shall submit a report to the court on all measures taken to give effect to this order within one week, as from the date of this order, and thereafter at such regular intervals as the court shall order until a final decision on the case is rendered by the court. Nine, the State of Israel shall refrain from any action and shall ensure that no action is taken which might aggravate or extend the dispute before the court or make it more difficult to resolve. End of quote. I thank the Registrar. Immediately after the application containing the request for the indication of provisional measures was filed, the Deputy Registrar transmitted an original copy thereof to the Government of Israel. He also notified the Secretary General of the United Nations. According to Article 74, Paragraph 1 of the Rules of Court, a request for the indication of provisional measures shall have priority over all other cases. Paragraph 2 of the same article states that the court shall proceed to a decision on the request as a matter of urgency. This imperative must, however, be balanced with the need to fix a date of oral proceedings in such a way as to afford the parties an opportunity to be represented at the hearings. Consequently, the parties were informed that the date for the opening of the oral proceedings, during which they could present their observations on the request for the indication of provisional measures, had been fixed for Thursday, 11 January 2024, at 10 a.m. I would now like to welcome the delegations of South Africa and Israel, and I note the presence before the court of the agents and counsel of both parties. This morning, the court will hear the single round of oral argument of South Africa, which has submitted the request for the indication of provisional measures. It will hear Israel tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. For purposes of this single round of oral argument, each party will have available to it 
a three-hour sitting. In this first sitting, South Africa may, if required, avail itself of a short extension beyond 1 p.m. today in view of the time taken up by these introductory remarks. Before I give the floor to the agent of South Africa, I wish to draw the party's attention to practice direction 11, which states as follows, I quote, in oral proceedings on the request for the indication of provisional measures, parties should limit themselves to what is relevant to the criteria for the indication of provisional measures as stipulated in the statute, rules, and jurisprudence of the court. They should not enter into the merits of the case beyond what is strictly necessary for that purpose. End of quote. I now give the floor to the agent of South Africa, His Excellency, Mr. Vizumuzi Madonsela. You have the floor, Excellency. Madam President, distinguished members of the court, it is an honor and a privilege for me to appear before you today on behalf of the Republic of South Africa. I wish to express my gratitude to the court for convening this hearing on the earliest possible date to entertain South Africa's request for the indication of provisional measures in this matter. In our application, South Africa has recognized the ongoing Nakba of the Palestinian people through Israel's colonization since 1948, which has systematically and forcibly dispossessed, displaced, and fragmented the Palestinian people, deliberately denying them their internationally recognized inalienable right to self-determination and their internationally recognized right of return as refugees to their towns and villages in what is now the state of Israel. We are also particularly mindful of Israel's institutionalized regime of discriminatory laws, policies and practices designed and maintained to establish domination, subjecting the Palestinian people to apartheid on both sides of the Green Line. Decades-long impunity for widespread and systematic human rights violations has emboldened Israel in its recurrence and intensification of international crimes in Palestine. At the outset, South Africa acknowledges that the genocidal acts and omissions by the State of Israel inevitably form part of a continuum of illegal acts perpetrated against the people, Palestinian people since 1948. The application places Israel's genocidal acts and omissions within the broader context of Israel's 75-year apartheid, 56-year occupation, and 16-year siege imposed on the Gaza Strip, a siege which itself has been described by the director of UNRWA affairs in Gaza as a silent killer of people. As the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination warned on December 21st, hate speech and dehumanizing discourse targeted at Palestinians is raising severe concerns regarding Israel and other states' parties' obligation to prevent crimes against humanity and genocide in the Gaza Strip. This warning has been followed by a succession of warnings, including by 37 United Nations uh, special rapporteurs of the failure of the international system to mobilize to prevent genocide in Gaza. Today, we are joined in court by representatives of the Palestinian state, the Palestinians who work in the fields of human rights, including residents of Gaza who were in Gaza just a few days ago. They are some of the lucky ones who managed to get out of Gaza. Their future and the future of their fellow Palestinians who are still in Gaza depend on the decision this court will make on this matter. With the leave of the court, I now call upon His Excellency, Mr. Ronald Lamola, Minister of Justice of the Republic of South Africa, to make South Africa's substantive opening remarks. I thank the agent of South Africa for his statement, and I now invite the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services for the Republic of South Africa, His Excellency Mr. Ronald Lamola, to take the floor. You have the floor, Excellency. Thank you, Madam President, 
and distinguished members of the court, it is an honor for me to stand here in front of you on behalf of the Republic of South Africa on this exceptional case. In extending our hands across the, li the miles to the people of Palestine, we do so in full knowledge that we are part of a humanity that is at one. These were the words of our founding president, Nelson Mandela. This is the spirit in which South Africa acceded to the convention on the prevention and punishment of crime of genocide in 1998. This is the spirit in which we approach this court as a contracting party to the convention. This is a commitment we owe to the people of Palestine and Israelis alike. As previously mentioned, the violence and the destruction in Palestine and Israel did not begin on the 7th of October 2023. The Palestinians have experienced systematic oppression and violence for the last 76 years. On 6 October 2023 and every day since October the 7th, 2023. In the Gaza Strip, at least since 2004, Israel continues to exercise control over the airspace, territorial waters, land crossing, water, electricity, and civilian infrastructure as well as over key government functions. Entry and exit by air and sea to Gaza is strictly prohibited, with Israel operating the only two crossing points. Given that continuing effective control by Israel and over the territory of Gaza, Israel is still considered by international community to be under belligerent occupation by Israel. South Africa unequivocally condemned the targeting of civilians by Hamas and other Palestinian armed groups and the taking of hostages on the 7th of October 2023. And as again expressly recorded this condemnation, mostly recently in its not verbal to Israel on the 21st of, no of December 2023. That said, no armed attack on a state territory, no matter how serious, even an attack involving atrocity crimes can provide any justification for or defense to breaches to the convention, whether as a matter of law or morality. Israel's response to the 7th of October 2023 attack has crossed this line and give rise to the breaches of the convention. Faced with such evidence and our duty to do what we can do to prevent genocide, as contained in Article 1 of the Convention, the South African government initiated this case. South Africa welcomes the fact that Israel has engaged with the case in order to have the matter resolved by the court. After careful and objective consideration of the facts and submission put before it, as the parties to the Convention have intended, this hearing is, con is concerned with South Africa's request to the court for the indication of provisional measures and will necessarily have a narrow and particular focus. I invoke the words of Martin Luther King when he said, the arch of the moral of the universe is law, always bending towards justice. South Africa's case will be presented by a team of six legal counsels, comprising of Dr. Adila Asim, Mr. Tembegan Dugaitobi, Professor John Dugat, Ms. Blim Likron, Mr. Max Dupris, and Professor Vagan Lowe. Dr. Adila Asim, Senior Counsel, will provide an overview of the risk of genocidal acts in the perpetual vulnerability to acts of genocide. Mr. Tembegan Dugaitobi, Senior Counsel, will examine Israel's alleged genocidal intent. Professor John Dugat, Senior Counsel, will focus on the Prima Facie jurisdiction. Professor Max Duplices, Senior Counsel, will discuss the various rights currently under threat. Blini Crowell, King's Counsel, will provide, will present the argument of agency and potential irreparable harm. And Professor Wagenloh, King's Counsel, will speak on the provisional measures. 
I now request Madam President, the court, to call on Dr. Hassim. I thank you. His Excellency, Mr. Lamola, and I now invite Ms. Adila Hassim to address the court. You have the floor, Madam. Thank you. Madam President, distinguished members of the court, it is a privilege to appear on behalf of the Republic of South Africa in this case of exceptional importance. It's a case that underscores the very essence of our shared humanity as expressed in the preamble to the Genocide Convention. It's my task to address the court on the genocidal acts that have led to this urgent request for provisional measures under Article 41 of the Statute of the Court. South Africa contends that Israel has transgressed Article 2 of the Convention by committing actions that fall within the definition of genocide. The actions show a systematic pattern of conduct from which genocide can be inferred. Allow me to place these acts in context. Gaza is one of the two constituent territories of the occupied Palestinian territories, occupied by Israel since 1967. It is a narrow strip of approximately 365 square kilometers as depicted in the map now displayed. Israel continues to exercise control over the space, territorial waters, land crossings, water, electricity, electromagnetic sphere, and civilian infrastructure in Gaza, as well as over key governmental functions. As the Honorable Minister has said, entry and exit by air and sea to Gaza is prohibited with Israel operating the only two crossing points. Gaza, which is one of the most densely populated places in the world, is home to approximately 2.3 million Palestinians, almost half of them children. For the past 96 days, Israel has subjected Gaza to what has been described as one of the heaviest conventional bombing campaigns in the history of modern warfare. Palestinians in Gaza are being killed by Israeli weaponry and bombs from air, land, and sea. They are also at immediate risk of death by starvation, dehydration, and disease as a result of the ongoing siege by Israel the destruction of Palestinian towns, the insufficient aid being allowed through to the Palestinian population, and the impossibility of distributing this limited aid while bombs fall. This conduct renders essentials to life unobtainable. At this provisional measures stage, as this court has made clear, in the Gambia Myanmar case, it is not necessary for the court to come to a final view on the question of whether Israel's conduct constitutes genocide. It is necessary to establish only whether at least some of the acts alleged are capable of falling within the provisions of the convention. On analyzing the specific and ongoing genocidal acts complained of, it is clear that at least some, if not all of these acts, fall within the Convention's provisions. These acts are documented in detail in South Africa's uh, application and confirmed by reliable, often UN, sources. It's thus unnecessary and impossible for me to recount all of them. I will highlight only some in order to illustrate the pattern of genocidal conduct. 
the UN statistics that are relied upon are up to date as of 9 January 2024. In South Africa's oral submissions, we will illustrate the facts that we rely on with limited use of audiovisual material. Madam President, we do so with restraint and only where necessary and always with respect to the Palestinian people. Against this background, I move now to demonstrate in turn how Israel's conduct violates Articles 2A, 2B, 2C and 2D of the Convention. The first genocidal act committed by Israel is the mass killing of Palestinians in Gaza in violation of Article 2A of the Genocide Convention. As the UN Secretary General explained five weeks ago, the level of Israel's killing is so extensive that nowhere is safe in Gaza. As I stand before you today, 23,210 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces during the sustained attacks over the last three months. At least 70% of whom are believed to be women and children. Some 7,000 Palestinians are still missing, presumed dead under the rubble. Palestinians in Gaza are subjected to relentless bombing wherever they go. They are killed in their homes, in places where they seek shelter, in hospitals, in schools, in mosques, in churches, and as they try to find food and water for their families. They have been killed if they failed to evacuate in the places to which they have fled, and even while they attempted to flee along Israeli declared safe routes. The level of killing is so extensive that those whose bodies are found are buried in mass graves, often unidentified. In the first three weeks alone, following 7 October, Israel deployed 6,000 bombs per week. At least 200 times it has deployed 2,000 pound bombs in southern areas of Palestine designated as safe. These bombs have also decimated the north, including refugee camps. 2,000 pound bombs are some of the biggest and most destructive bombs available. They are dropped by lethal fighter jets that are used to strike targets on the ground by one of the world's most resourced armies. Israel has killed an unparalleled and unprecedented number of civilians with the full knowledge of how many civilian lives each bomb will take. More than 1,800 families, Palestinian families in Gaza, have lost multiple family members, and hundreds of multi-generational -gener families have been wiped out with no remaining survivors. Mothers, fathers, children, siblings, grandparents, aunts, cousins, often all killed together. This killing is nothing short of destruction of Palestinian life. It is inflicted deliberately. No one is spared, not even newborn babies. The scale of Palestinian child killings in Gaza is such that UN chiefs have described it as a graveyard for children. The devastation we submit is intended is intended to and has laid waste to Gaza beyond any acceptable legal, let alone humane, justification.
The second genocidal act identified in South Africa's application is Israel's infliction of serious bodily or mental harm to Palestinians in Gaza in violation of Article 2B of the Genocide Convention. Israel's attacks have left close to 60,000 Palestinians wounded and maimed. Again, the majority of them women and children. This in circumstances where the healthcare system has all but collapsed. I return to this later in my speech. Large numbers of Palestinian civilians, including children, are arrested, blindfolded, forced to undress, and loaded onto trucks taken to unknown locations. The suffering of the Palestinian people, physical and mental, is undeniable. Turning to the third genocidal act under Article 2C, Israel has deliberately imposed conditions on Gaza that cannot sustain life and are calculated to bring about its physical destruction. Israel achieves this in at least four ways. First, by displacement. Israel has forced, forced the displacement of about 85% of Palestinians in Gaza. There is nowhere safe for them to flee to. Those who cannot leave or refuse to be displaced have either been killed or at extreme risk of being killed in their homes. Many Palestinians have been displaced multiple times as families are forced to move repeatedly in search of safety. Israel's first evacuation order on 13 October required the evacuation of over one million people, including children, the elderly, the wounded, and infirm. Entire hospitals were required to evacuate even newborn babies in intensive care. The order required them to evacuate the north to the south within 24 hours. The order itself was genocidal. It required immediate movement, taking only what could be carried, while no humanitarian assistance was permitted, and fuel, water, and food, and other necessities of life had deliberately been cut off. It was clearly calculated to bring about the destruction of the population. For many Palestinians, the forced evacuation from their homes is inevitably permanent. Israel has now damaged or destroyed an estimated 355,000 Palestinian homes, leaving at least half a million Palestinians with no home to return to. The Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons explains that houses and infrastructure, quote, have been razed to the ground, frustrating any realistic prospects for displaced Gazans to return home, repeating a long history of mass forced displacement of Palestinians by Israel. There is no indication at all that Israel accepts responsibility for rebuilding what it has destroyed. Instead, the destruction is celebrated by the Israeli army. Soldiers film themselves joyfully detonating entire apartment blocks and town squares, erecting the Israeli flag over the wreckage, seeking to re-establish Israeli settlements on the rubble of Palestinian homes, and thus extinguishing the very basis of Palestinian life in Gaza. Second, together with the forced displacement, Israel's conduct has been deliberately calculated to cause widespread hunger, dehydration, and starvation. Israel's campaign has pushed Gazans to the brink of famine. An unprecedented 93% of the population in Gaza is facing crisis levels of hunger. 
of all the people in the world currently suffering catastrophic hunger, more than 80% are in Gaza. The situation is such that the experts are now predicting that more Palestinians in Gaza may die from starvation and disease than airstrikes. And yet Israel continues to impede the effective delivery of humanitarian assistance to Palestinians, not only refusing to allow sufficient aid in, but removing the ability to distribute it through constant bombardment and obstruction. Just three days ago, on 8 January, a planned mission by UN agencies to deliver urgent medical supplies and vital fuel to a hospital and medical supply center was, was denied by Israeli authorities. This marked the fifth denial of a mission to the center since 26 December, leaving five hospitals in northern Gaza without access to life-saving medical supplies and equipment. Aid trucks that are allowed in are seized upon by the hungry. What is provided is simply not enough. Madam President, members of the court, this is an image of an aid truck arriving in Gaza. Israel has deliberately inflicted conditions in which Palestinians in Gaza are denied adequate shelter, clothes, or sanitation. For weeks, there have been acute shortages of clothes, bedding, blankets, and critical non-food items. Clean water is all but gone, leaving far below the amount required to safely drink, clean, and cook. Accordingly, the WHO has stated that Gaza is experiencing soaring rates of infectious disease outbreaks. Cases of diarrhea in children under five years of age have increased 2,000% since hostilities began. When combined and left untreated, malnutrition and disease create a deadly cycle. The fourth genocidal act under Article 2B is Israel's military assault on Gaza's health care system, which renders life unsustainable. Even by 7 December, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health noted that the health care of infrastructure in the Gaza Strip has been completely obliterated. Those wounded by Israel in Gaza are being deprived of life-saving medical care. Gaza's health care system, already crippled by years of blockade and prior attacks by Israel, is unable to cope with the sheer scale of the injuries. Finally, the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls has pointed to acts committed by Israel that would fall under the, cat under the fourth category of genocidal acts in Article 2D of the Convention. On 22 November, she expressly warned the following. The, rep the reproductive violence inflicted by Israel on Palestinian women, newborn babies, infants, and children could be qualified as acts of genocide under Article 2 of the Genocide Convention, including imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group. Israel is blocking the delivery of life-saving aid including essential medical kits for delivering babies in circumstances where an estimated 180 women are giving birth in Gaza 
each day of these 180 women, the WHO warns that 15% are likely to experience pregnancy or birth-related complications and need additional medical care. That care is simply not available. In sum, Madam President, all of these acts, individually and collectively, form a calculated pattern of conduct by Israel, indicating a genocidal intent. This intent is evident from Israel's conduct in specially targeting Palestinians living in Gaza, using weaponry that causes large-scale homicidal destruction, as well as targeting sni targeted sniping of civilians, designating safe zones for Palestinians to seek refuge, and then bombing these, depriving Palestinians in Gaza of basic needs, food, water, health care, fuel, sanitation, and communications, destroying social infrastructure, homes, schools, mosques, churches, hospitals, and killing, seriously injuring, and leaving large numbers of children orphaned. Genocides are never declared in advance. But this court has the benefit of the past 13 weeks of evidence that shows incontrovertibly a pattern of conduct and related intention that justifies a plausible claim of genocidal acts. In the Gambia Myanmar case, this court did not hesitate to impose provisional measures in relation to allegations that Myanmar was committing genocidal acts against the Rohingya within the Rakhine state. The facts before the court today are sadly even more stark and like the Gambia Myanmar case, deserve and demand this court's intervention. Every day, there is mounting irreparable loss of life, property, dignity, and humanity for the Palestinian people. Our news feeds show graphic images of suffering that has become unbearable to watch. Nothing will stop the suffering except an order from this court. Without an indication of provisional measures, the atrocities will continue with the Israeli Defense Force indicating that it intends pursuing this course of action for at least a year. In the words of the UN Under Secretary General on 5 January 2024, I quote, you think getting aid into Gaza is easy? Think again. Three layers of inspections before trucks can even enter. Confusion and long queues, a growing list of rejected items, a crossing point meant for pedestrians, not trucks, another crossing point where trucks have been blocked by desperate, hungry communities, a destroyed commercial sector, constant bombardments, poor communications, damaged roads, convoys shot at, damaged delays at checkpoints, a traumatized and exhausted population crammed into a smaller and smaller sliver of land. Shelters which have long exceeded their full capacity. Aid workers themselves displaced, killed. This is an impossible situation for the people of Gaza and for those trying to help them. The fighting must stop. Close quote. Madam President, members of the court, that concludes my section on the genocidal conduct of Israel.
I thank you for your patient attention, and I ask that you call Advocate Muka Tobi to the podium to address the court on genocidal intent. I thank Ms. Hassim, and I now invite Mr. Tembeke Nuka Tobi to address the court. Have the floor, sir. Madam President and distinguished members of the court, it is a privilege to appear before the court on behalf of South Africa. I will address Israel's genocidal intent. At this stage, the court is not required to determine that the only inference to be drawn from the available evidence is genocidal to order provisional measures, as that is to decide the merits. Rather, the assessment of the existence of an intent to destroy could be made by the court only at the stage of the examination of the merits. That some of the alleged acts may also amount to atrocities other than genocide does not exclude the finding of plausible acts of genocide. Madam President, South Africa is not alone in drawing attention to Israel's genocidal rhetoric against Palestinians in Gaza. Fifteen United Nations Special Rapporteurs and 21 members of the United Nations Working Groups have warned that what is happening in Gaza reflects a genocide in the making and an overt intent to destroy the Palestinian people under occupation. Israel has a genocidal intent against the Palestinians in Gaza. That is evident from the way in which Israel's military attack is being conducted, which has been described by Ms. Hassim S.C. It is systematic in its character and form. The mass displacement of the population of Gaza headed into areas where they continue to be killed and the deliberate creation of conditions that, quote, lead to a slow death, unquote. There is also the clear pattern of conduct, the targeting of family homes and civilian infrastructure, laying waste to vast areas of Gaza, and the bombing, shelling, and sniping of men, women, and children where they stand, the destruction of the health infrastructure, and lack of access to humanitarian assistance. So much so that as we stand today, 1% of the Palestinian population in Gaza has been systematically decimated. And one in four Gazans have been injured since 7 October. These two elements alone are capable of evidencing Israel's genocidal intent in relation to the whole or part of the Palestinian population in Gaza. However, third, there is an extraordinary feature in this case that Israel's political leaders, military commanders, and persons holding official positions have systematically and in explicit terms declared their genocidal intent. And these statements are then repeated by soldiers on the ground in Gaza as they engage in the destruction of Palestinians and the physical infrastructure of Gaza. We show this third element next. Israel's special genocidal intent is rooted in the belief that in fact the enemy is not just the military wing of Hamas or indeed Hamas generally, but is embedded in the fabric of Palestinian life in Gaza. On 7 October, in a televised address, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared war on Gaza, and I quote, Israel had started clearing out the communities that have been infiltrated by terrorists. 
and he warned of an unprecedented price to be paid by the enemy. There are more than 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza. Israel is the occupying power in control of Gaza. It controls entry, exit, and the internal movements of inside Gaza. And qua Prime Minister, Mr. Netanyahu exercises overall command over the Israeli Defense Force and in turn, the Palestinians in Gaza. Prime Minister Netanyahu in his address to the Israeli forces on 28 October 2023, preparing for the invasion of Gaza, urged the soldiers to remember what Amalek has done to you. This refers to the biblical command by God to Saul for the retaliatory destruction of an entire group of people known as the Amalekites, put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. The genocidal invocation to Amalek was anything but idle. It was repeated by Mr. Netanyahu in a letter to the Israeli Armed Forces on 3 November 2023. Madam President, let the Prime Minister's words speak for themselves. done to you says our holy bible and we do remember and we are fighting our brave troops and combatants who are now in gaza or around gaza and in The Deputy Speaker of the Knesset, Israel's parliament, has called for the erasure of the Gaza Strip from the face of the earth. The Defense Force agrees. On 9 October, the Defense Minister, Yoav Gallant, gave a situation update to the army, where he said that as Israel was imposing a complete siege on Gaza, there would be no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel. Everything would be closed because Israel is fighting human animals. <coughs> Speaking to troops on the Gaza border, he instructed them that he has released all the restraints and that Gaza won't return to what it was before. We will eliminate everything we will reach all places. Eliminate everything, reach all places without any restraints. The theme of destruction of human animals was reiterated by an Israeli army coordinator of government activities in the territories on 9 October 2023, who, in an address to Hamas and the residents of Gaza, stated that Hamas has become ISIS and that the citizens of Gaza are celebrating instead of being horrified. He concluded that human animals are dealt with accordingly. Israel has imposed a total blockade on Gaza. No electricity, no water, just damage. You wanted hell, you will get hell. The language of systematic dehumanization is evident here. Human animals. Both Hamas and civilians are condemned. Within the Israeli cabinet, this is also a widely held view. The Minister of Energy and Infrastructure, Israel Katz, called for the denial of water and fuel, as this is what will happen to a people of children killers and slaughterers. This admits of no ambiguity. It means to create conditions of death of the Palestinian people in Gaza. To die a slow death because of starvation and dehydration, or to die quickly because of a bomb attack or snipers, but to die nevertheless. In fact, Heritage Minister Amichai Eliyahu said that Israel must find ways for Gazans that are more painful than death. 
It is no answer to say that neither are in command of the army. They are ministers in the Israeli government. They vote in the Knesset and are in a position to shape state policy. The intent to destroy Gaza has been nurtured at the highest levels of state. As President Isaac Herzog has joined the ranks of those signing bombs destined for Gaza. Having previously noted that the entire population in Gaza is responsible and that this rhetoric about civilians not aware, not involved is absolutely not true, we will fight until we break their backbone. Later attempts by the President and others to neutralize this speech have not altered the sting of his words, which was to tar all Palestinians as responsible for the actions of Hamas. No, as I will show below, has it affected how state policy is understood within government. The Minister of National Security repeated the President's statements that Hamas and civilians are responsible in equal measure. On 10 November 2023, in a televised interview, he stated that when we say that Hamas should be destroyed, it also means those who celebrate, those who support, and those who hand out candy. They are all terrorists, and they should also be destroyed. These are orders to destroy and to maim what cannot be destroyed. These statements are not open to neutral interpretations or after the fact rationalizations and reinterpretations by Israel. The statements were made by persons in command of the state. They communicated state policy. It is simple. If the statements were not intended, they would not have been made. The genocidal intent behind these statements is not ambiguous to the Israeli soldiers on the ground. Indeed, it is directing their actions and objectives. On 7 December 2023, Israeli soldiers proved that they understood the Prime Minister's message to remember what the Amalek has done to you as genocide. They were recorded by journalists dancing and singing. We know our motto, there are no uninvolved, that they obey one commandment, to wipe off the seed of Amalek. The Prime Minister's invocation of Amalek is being used by soldiers to justify the killing of civilians, including children. These are the soldiers repeating the inciting words of their Prime Minister. soldiers in Gaza were filmed dancing, chanting, and singing in November. May their village burn, may Gaza be erased. There is now a trend among the soldiers to film themselves committing atrocities against civilians in Gaza in a form of snuff video. One recorded himself detonating over 50 houses in Shujaiya. Other soldiers were recorded singing we will destroy all of Khan Yunus and this house. We will blow it up for you and for everything you do for us. These are the soldiers putting into effect their command.
The commanders of the army are also of the same mind. Israeli army commander Yair Ben David has stated that the army had done in Beit Hanon and did there as Shimon and Levi did in Nablus, and that the entire Gaza should resemble Beit Hanon. Israeli soldier Yeshai Shalev published a video against the backdrop of the ruins of what was the site of Al-Azhar University with the caption, once upon a time there was a university in Gaza and in practice a school for murderers and human animals. Soldiers obviously believe that this language and their actions are acceptable because the destruction of Palestinian life in Gaza is articulated state policy. Senior political and military officials encouraged without censure the 95-year-old Israeli army reservist Ezra Yachin, a veteran of the Deir Yassin massacre against the Palestinians in 1948, to speak to the soldiers ahead of the ground invasion in Gaza. In his tour, he echoed the same sentiment while being driven around in an officially Israeli army vehicle dressed in Israeli army fatigue, I quote, be triumphant and finish them off and don't leave anyone behind. He raised the memory of them. He raised them, their families, mothers and children. These animals can no longer live. If you have an Arab neighbor, don't wait, go to his home and shoot him. We want to invade, not like before. We want to enter and destroy what's in front of us, and destroy houses, then destroy the one after it. With all of our forces, complete destruction, enter and destroy. As you can see, we will witness things we've never dreamed of. Let, the, let them drop bombs on them and erase them. As recently as 7 January 2024, a video of a soldier was posted online where he boasts that the army had destroyed the entire village of Hibat Azar. For two weeks, he said, they had worked hard to bomb the village and executed their mandate. Any suggestion that senior politicians did not mean what they said, much less that the meaning was not understood by soldiers in Gaza, would be without any merit. The scale of destruction in Gaza, the mass targeting of family homes and civilians, the war being a war on children, all make clear that genocidal intent is both understood and is being put into practice. The articulated intent is the destruction of Palestinian life in all its manifestations. The genocidal rhetoric is also commonplace within the Israeli Knesset. Members of the Knesset have repeatedly called for Gaza to be wiped out, flattened, erased, and crushed on all its inhabitants. They have deplored anyone feeling sorry for the uninvolved Gazans, asserting repeatedly that there are no uninvolved that there are no innocents in Gaza, that the killers of the women and children should not be separated from the citizens of Gaza, and that the children of Gaza have brought this upon themselves, and that there should be one sentence for everyone there, death. Finally, the lawmakers have called for mercilessly bombing from the air, with some advocating for the use of nuclear doomsday weapons and a Nakba that will overshadow the Nakba of 48. The Prime Minister's genocidal speech has gained ground among some elements of civil society. A famous singer has repeated Mr. Netanyahu's Amalek reference 
stating that Gaza must be wiped out and be destroyed with every Amalek seed. We simply must destroy all of Gaza and exterminate everyone who is there. Another has called to erase Gaza, not leave a single person there. Journalists and commentators have announced that the woman is an enemy, the baby is an enemy, the pregnant woman is an enemy. That it is necessary to turn the strip into a slaughterhouse, to demolish every house our soldiers come across, exterminate everyone. The intentional failure of the government of Israel to condemn, prevent, and punish such genocidal incitement constitutes in itself a grave violation of the Genocide Convention. We should recall, Madam President, that in Article 1 of the Convention, Israel confirmed that genocide, whether con committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime under international law. And it undertook to prevent and to punish it as such. This failure to prevent, condemn, and punish such speech by the government has served to normalize genocidal rhetoric and extreme danger for Palestinians within Israeli society. As M.K. Moshe Sada from the Likud party has said, the government's own attorneys share his views that Palestinians in Gaza must be destroyed. I quote, you go anywhere and they tell you to destroy them. In the kibbutz, they tell you to destroy them. My friends at the state attorney's office who fought with me on political issues in debate said to me, it is clear that we need to destroy all Gazans. Destroy all Gazans. Israel is aware of its destruction of Palestinian life and infrastructure. Despite this knowledge, it has maintained and indeed intensified its military activity in Gaza. As to full awareness, in the week after 7 October, NGOs and the United Nations warned of an unprecedented humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The UN stated that actors must allow humanitarian teams and goods to immediately and safely reach the hundreds of thousands of people in need. So right from the beginning, Israel knew that it was depriving water, food, electricity, and essentials for survival. It said so. Everything is closed. It has known that it was depriving Palestinians of health care and treatment for injury in the middle of an unprecedented bombardment of food and water and of other essentials for survival. This prompted the World Health Organization to say, we are on our knees asking for sustained, scaled up, protected humanitarian operations, appealing to all those in a situation to make a decision or influence decision makers to give us the humanitarian space to address this human catastrophe. Despite this knowledge, Israel continues to target infrastructure essential for survival. Water and sanitation infrastructure, solar panels, bakeries, mills, crops. It bombs hospitals, decimating the healthcare system. It targets aid workers and the infrastructure of the United Nations. It is because of the policy of Israel that Gaza has become a place of death and despair. In conclusion, Madam President, many propagators of grave atrocities have protested that they were misunderstood, <coughs> that they did not mean what they said, and that their own words were taken out of context. What state would admit to a genocidal intent? Yet, the distinctive feature of this case has not been the silence as such, but the reiteration and the repetition of genocidal speech throughout every sphere of state in Israel. We remind the court 
of the identity and authority of the genocidal inciters. The Prime Minister, the President, the Minister of Defense, the Minister of National Security, the Minister of Energy and Infrastructure, members of the Knesset, senior army officials and foot soldiers. Genocidal utterances are therefore not out in the fringes. They are embodied in state policy. The intent to destroy is plainly understood by soldiers on the ground. It is also fully understood by some within the Israeli society, with the government facing criticism for allowing in any aid to Gaza on the basis that it is recanting on its promise to starve Palestinians. Any suggestion that Israeli officials did not mean what they said or were not fully understood by soldiers and civilians alike to mean what they said should be rejected by this court. The evidence of genocidal intent is not only chilling, it is also overwhelming and incontrovertible. Madam President, it is now my honor to request you to call Mr. John Dugat on the subject of jurisdiction. I thank Mr. Gutkai Toby, and I now invite Professor John Dugard to take the floor. You have the floor, Professor. Madam President, distinguished members of the court, it is a great privilege to appear before you today on behalf of the Republic of South Africa. In my speech, I will address the question of jurisdiction. The people of South Africa and of Israel both have a history of suffering. Both states have become parties to the Genocide Convention in the determination to end suffering. In this spirit, neither has attached a reservation to Article 9 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. It is in terms of this Convention dedicated to saving humanity that South Africa brings this dispute before the Court. <coughs> the prohibition on genocide is a peremptory norm. Obligations under the Genocide Convention are ergo omnes, obligations owed to the international community as a whole. States parties to this convention are obliged not only to desist from genocidal acts, but also to prevent them. That the obligation of state parties to prevent acts of genocide is the foundation of the convention is clear from its placement in Article 1 of the Convention. <laughs> Article 9 of the Genocide Convention makes it clear that state parties are guardians of the Genocide Convention. Unlike other treaties designed to protect human rights, it does not oblige states to pursue negotiations as a prelude to approaching this court. It does not treat the ending of genocidal acts as a bilateral affair between states. Instead, it envisages a situation in which a state, acting on behalf of the international community as a whole, seizes the jurisdiction of the court as a matter of urgency to prevent genocide. South Africa has a long history of close relations with Israel. For this reason, it did not bring the dispute immediately to the attention of the court. It watched with horror as Israel responded to the terrible atrocities committed against its people on 7 of October with an attack on Gaza that resulted in the indiscriminate killing of innocent Palestinian civilians, most of whom were women and children. The South African government repeatedly voiced its concerns in the Security Council and in public statements 
that Israel's actions had become genocidal. On 10 November, in a formal diplomatic day march, it informed Israel that while it condemned the actions of Hamas, it wanted the International Criminal Court to investigate the leadership of Israel for international crimes, including genocide. As the court will know, the definition of genocide in the Rome Statute repeats that of the Genocide Convention. On 17 October, South Africa referred Israel's commission of the crime of genocide to the International Criminal Court for, quote, vigorous investigation, unquote. In announcing this decision, President Ramaphosa publicly expressed his abhorrence for what is happening right now in Gaza, which is now turned into a concentration camp where genocide is taking place. To accuse a state of committing acts of genocide and to condemn it in such strong language is a major act on the part of a state. At this stage, it became clear that there was a serious dispute between South Africa and Israel, which would end only with the end of Israel's genocidal act. South Africa repeated this accusation at a meeting of BRICS on 21 November, and at an emergency special session of the United Nations General Assembly on 12 December. No response from Israel was forthcoming. None was necessary. By this time, the dispute had crystallized as a matter of law. This was confirmed by Israel's official and unequivocal denial on 6 December that it was committing genocide in Gaza. However, as a matter of courtesy, before filing the present application, on 21 December, South Africa sent a note verbal to the Embassy of Israel to reiterate its view that Israel's acts of genocide in Gaza amounted to genocide, that it as a state party to the Genocide Convention was under an obligation to prevent genocide from being committed. Israel responded by way of a note per mile that failed to address the issues raised by South Africa in its note and neither affirmed nor denied the existence of a dispute. <coughs> This was emailed later on the 27th of December. This note was received by the relevant South African team on the 29th of December after the present application was filed. On 4 January, South Africa replied to this note verbal, highlighting Israel's failure to prevent any response to the matters raised by South Africa over the previous months, as reiterated in its note verbal. South Africa made it clear that given Israel's ongoing conduct against Palestinians in Gaza, the dispute re referred to in its note verbal of 21 December remained unresolved and was plainly not capable of resolution by way of a bilateral meeting. Nevertheless, South Africa proposed a meeting on 5 January, again out of courtesy. Israel responded to this note verbal by proposing that we reconnect to coordinate a meeting at the earliest opportunity after the close of hearings in the present case. To this, South Africa understandably replied that such a meeting would serve no purpose. Madam President, these notes verbal are all to be found in the judge's folder. The existence of a dispute is a matter to be determined by an objective determination of the facts as they existed at the time of the filing of the application. At this time, South Africa had already accused Israel in the Security Council the General Assembly and other public fora 
of engaging in genocidal acts. It had conducted a diplomatic day march on Israel, warning it that it viewed its conduct as genocidal. It had requested the International Criminal Court to vigorously investigate crimes under the Genocide Convention committed by Israel in the Gaza Strip, and it accused Israel inter alia of the deliberate targeting of civilians, intentionally causing starvation and impeding relief supplies. It had accused Israel leaders of expressing, quote, the intent of committing genocide. Israel had flatly denied South Africa's accusations. <coughs> Despite these harsh accusations, Israel has persisted in its genocidal acts against the population of Gaza. What more evidence could be required to establish a dispute? It is precisely because of a situation of this kind, affecting the international community as a whole, that Article 9 of the Genocide Convention does not require negotiations as a precondition to seizing the jurisdiction of the court. Certainly, a respondent state cannot prevent a referral to the court by claiming that there is no dispute and that it wants discussions on this matter when the existence of the dispute is clear. For a state to insist on a time frame for negotiations would simply be a license to commit genocide and would run counter to the object and purpose of the Geneva, of the Genocide Convention. Madam President, the question of the crystallization of a dispute has been addressed by this court in preliminary objections at the merit stage where the burden of proof is higher. Although the court has generally adopted a flexible approach to the subject, it has laid down a number of tests for the existence of a dispute. First, it must be shown that the claim of one party is positively opposed by the other. Second, the date for determining the existence of the dispute is the date of the application, but subsequent conduct may be considered. Three, whether the dispute exists must be determined by an objective determination of the facts. And four, a dispute exists when it is demonstrated on the basis of the evidence that the respondent was aware or could not have been unaware that its views were positively opposed. When these propositions are applied to the facts of this case, it is incontrovertible that a dispute exists between South Africa and Israel. South Africa strongly believes that what Israel is doing in Gaza amounts to genocide. Israel denies this and claims that such an accusation is legally and factually wrong and, <coughs> moreover, is obscene. So an objective determination of the facts shows that a dispute existed on the date of the submission of South Africa's application, and this has been confirmed by Israel's subsequent statements and by its continuing conduct in Gaza. Moreover, Israel must have been aware from South Africa's public statements, the demarche, and the referral of the matter to the International Criminal Court of Israel's genocidal acts that a dispute existed between the two states. Madam President, the court has indicated that in an application for provisional measures, it is sufficient to show that there is a prima facie basis for jurisdiction. It is submitted that South Africa has convincingly established the existence of a dispute between it and Israel over the fulfillment 
of the latter's obligations under the Genocide Convention. Finally, it is submitted that regard should be had to the special considerations that apply to the existence of a dispute under Article 9 of the Genocide Convention between a state that brings an application in furtherance of its obligation to prevent genocide and a state accused of committing genocide. This, this concludes my speech. Madam President, I thank you, the members of the court, for your attention. I now ask you to call to the podium Professor Max to proceed to address you on the nature of the rights requiring protection and the link between such rights and the, and the measures requested. Thank you. I thank you, Professor Dugard. Before I give the floor to the next speaker, the court will observe a coffee break of 10 minutes. Sitting is adjourned.